بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters and friends and welcome to today's live Facebook video I'm going to try and do these as regularly as possible in order for us to benefit بإذنillah inshallah God willing today's topic is going to be Exactly the same as last week's, which is about really understanding how to reconcile science and revelation, how to understand science and revelation, how to look into the Quran and derive the true meanings and intentions that underlie the ayat, the verses that point towards man, life and the universe. And this is extremely important for us, especially in a contemporary sense. We live in an age of science, we live in an age of scientific rationalism, where we have deified science almost. And this is not very academic at all, because we know, and this is actually a challenge, when you study, and if you were to study the philosophy of science, if you were to study mainstream academia, you would see that science doesn't lead to certainty. And that's one of the beauties of science because it's supposed to change based on new observation. It's supposed to change based on new understandings and new concepts and ideas which are based on new empirical data. And that's why it's very important for us to have an open mind when we're scientists and when we look at the workings of science because when we see things like scientific facts, we have to understand well, what does that really mean? Because a scientific fact really means it's the best that we have. It's the best understanding that we have. Especially when it concerns having lots of different empirical data at your disposal. And this is why in the philosophy of science, you have things like induction. You have things like inference to the best explanation. You have things like the hypothetical deductive model. You have things like holism, you have things like many other things. Now, the reason I'm mentioning these words is not to baffle you, but to make you understand that when you address or look into these aspects of the philosophy of science, you will know that it does not lead to certainty. Let's take induction, for example. Induction is a thinking process where you move from the specific to the general, you move from the observed to the unobserved. For example, I've observed 1,000 black crows therefore all crows are black so you have a limited set of observations and you go for to the general you have specific data if you like and you move to a generalization so you have only a thousand black crows therefore you conclude all crows are black and we know this thinking process is probabilistic it doesn't lead to certainty because you may have a future observation or another observation that denies previous conclusions. For example, you could claim that you have observed a thousand white sheep, therefore all sheep are white. We know this is not true because a black sheep has been observed in Europe, for example. So it's not the case that all sheep are white. So there could be another observation that is, as, is at odds with your conclusions or with your data. And this is the nature of science. Most of science is based fundamentally, you could trace it back to this concept of induction, which is probabilistic, it doesn't lead to certainty. Now there's so much more we could talk about this. We could go into, for example, what Hume said about this, the likes of Reichenbach. We could talk about what Bertrand Russell said. But to be honest, if you study this properly, you would see that the conclusion is well known. There is a consensus amongst the philosophers of science and even scientists that induction does not lead to certainty. And even if you were to look at other aspects of the philosophy of science, it's the same thing. And that's actually the beauty of science. It's supposed to change based on new observed phenomena. So the reason I was mentioning this is because we live in an age of scientific rationalism. We've deified science as if we've made science the God. We've made science wahi into revelation, which is not the case at all. And when you study the history of science, you would actually see that science changes. And that's the beauty of science. And we can't even claim that, well, science is true because it works. 
because there's a bit of a fallacy here. I call it the Richard Dawkins fallacy because Richard Dawkins was asked this question about how can we epistemically justify the scientific method? How do we know it leads to truth? And he basically answered by saying, well, it works. Well, that's not really profound or it's not robust. It's not true what he said. Why? Because just because something works, it doesn't mean it's true. And when we study the history of science, we study the philosophy of science, we know this is the case. For example, in the 18th century, we had this theory called phlogiston. Phlogiston was a theory that combustible objects, things that would burn, they had something called phlogiston in them. And when they burned, they released phlogisticated air. Now, this was a theory that was working. It was working where it was working so much that in around 1773, Dan Rutherford, he used this theory to discover a truth, to discover nitrogen. And that's very interesting. He discovered a truth from the theory of phlogiston, using the theory of phlogiston. But a few more years down the line, we realized that phlogiston was actually a false theory. Now, what's the, what's the lesson here? The lesson is you can gain a truth, the idea that nitrogen exists, from a falsehood, which is the theory of phlogiston. And something that works, because phlogiston was a theory that was working, doesn't mean it's actually true, because we found out later that phlogiston theory actually is false. So it doesn't follow that just because something works, it means it's true. And that's very important for you to understand, brothers and sisters. So the whole point of today is to apply these basic concepts, and I'll probably do another lecture in detail on the philosophy of science, but let's focus now concerning the question that we have at hand, which is the Qur'an and science. Are there scientific miracles in the Qur'an? What is the correct approach in understanding science in the Qur'an, in reconciling science with the Qur'an? What is the correct approach? Now, the way I'm going to address this is basically by summarizing what the mainstream, what I mean by mainstream is the popular approach amongst some of our callers to Islam. A caller to Islam is someone who basically invites people to Islam. And the way that they have articulated the scientific miracles in the Quran is as follows. There's three main ways. And I have some slides here to follow through. Number one, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not have access to the scientific knowledge mentioned in the Quran. Therefore, it must be from God. That's one way they have, they've articulated this. Number two, no one at the time of Revelation, which was the 7th century, had access to the necessary equipment to understand or verify the scientific knowledge in the Qur'an. Therefore, it must be from God. Finally, another way that they articulate the, the so-called scientific miracles in the Qur'an is they say that the Qur'anic verses were revealed at a time where science was so primitive, no human being could have uttered the truths mentioned in the Qur'an. Therefore, it must be from God. So this, the general three main ways in which some Muslims who articulate a positive case for Islam have basically tried to verify or justify the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using science. What I'm going to do is this, brothers and sisters. I'm going to deconstruct this approach in six main ways. I'm going to show how this approach, trying to show that there is scientific, scientific miracles in the Qur'an, I'm going to show that this approach is actually wrong, it's, it's misleading, it's not accurate, and it basically misinforms people about the philosophy of science, and it misinforms people about the nature of the ayat, the nature of the verses in the Qur'an concerning natural phenomena. And it actually misleads people concerning our classical orthodox tradition and especially our spiritual tradition, this is so important for us to understand because it's really, I would even argue, a sign of our ignorance of the Qur'an, our sign of our ignorance of our Islamic intellectual tradition and an ignorance of, of really connecting with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, these are the six main ways in which I'm going to deconstruct the scientific miracles in the Qur'an approach. And then, and then after that, I'm going to reconstruct an approach, if you like, reconstruct a, a profound approach, an orthodox approach, 
in how to use science in the Quran, which is based on orthodoxy and based on correct premises and assumptions rather than the incorrect assumptions that the scientific miracles in the Quran approach is currently using. So I'm going to use six things to deconstruct, then I'm going to introduce a new approach. And this new approach, I like to call it the multi-layered and multi-leveled approach. What is the multi-layered and multi-leveled approach? Basically, that when Allah uses words or verses in the Quran to refer to natural phenomena, these words have many layers of meaning, so they're multi-layered. Each layer of meaning is appropriate for different levels of understanding across time. This approach is far more profound and I'll explain to you that later. But let's first now deconstruct the scientific miracles in the Quran approach. The first thing I want to talk about is, number one, the purpose of Quranic verses. Brothers and sisters, we have to understand what are the main purposes, what is the main purpose of ayat, of verses, when they address natural phenomena. What are their purpose? Are their purpose to basically discuss details about science? Of course not. The ulama have studied this. We see this in our Islamic intellectual tradition, in the books of, in the explanations of Aqid al Hawi and others. We understand that the ayat, when they refer to natural phenomena, they're not there to give you details, but they're there to make you realize that Allah is the Lord, He is the creator of the universe and the sustainer of the universe, and that by realizing this, He deserves to be worshipped. He deserves to be worshipped. Many of the ulama, they say that this refers to the tawheed of rububiyya, the tawheed of the lordship and the creative power of Allah, and by understanding the creative power of Allah, it would make us now project ourselves and make us be convinced of the fact that Allah deserves to be worshipped, which is the Tawheed of Uluhiyya or the Tawheed of Al-Ibadah. This is very important. And it's significant for us to understand this, brothers and sisters and friends, because it makes us connect with the Qur'an in a spiritual way and it makes us understand the Qur'an as as how the Qur'an wanted us to connect with it, how Allah wanted us to connect with the Book of Allah. And there are many examples for us to understand, but we also see this in the classical tafsir, in the classical exegesis, exegetical works from Ibn Kathir, Al-Qurtubi, the tafsir of Jalalain, and many others. We see that these verses, when they concerned natural phenomena, they were basically there to awaken a reality that there is a creative power in the universe or behind this creation and that there is a wisdom behind the universe or behind this creation. For example, when Allah told us to reflect on how the camel was created, for example, look into how the camel was created. Does Allah want us to understand all of the science behind this? No, that's not the primary reason. The primary reason is for us to understand that whatever I have of scientific knowledge, whatever limitations of the science I understand, whatever knowledge I have of the how the, the, the camel was created, there, is still, there still must have been a power behind this and a wisdom behind this. Let me repeat. So when Allah says, look into the camel and how it was created, it must make us realize not that there is some kind of scientific details in this. Yes, there is science. But Allah doesn't want us to know all the science necessarily. He wants us to understand, regardless of our limited knowledge of the science, and regardless of our progress across history, there's always going to be two facts. These are that there must have been a power behind this, a creative power, and there must have been a wisdom behind this. This is extremely spiritual, because Allah is not expecting you to have the right knowledge of science because science is going to change as we discussed in the beginning. But rather, Allah wants you to use whatever limited knowledge that you have for you to understand that there must have been a creative power behind this and there must have been a wisdom behind this. This is ex a lot. This is very important for us to understand, brothers and sisters, extremely important. And this is why from this perspective, an ayah, a verse, when it refers to natural phenomena, when it refers to creative things, things that have been created, they're there to awaken the self-evident truth 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves to be worshipped. This is very important because in our Islamic tradition, we have the concept of the fitra, the fitra. Now, the fitra is the thing that Allah created within us, this natural disposition, this primordial state that Allah created within us that has the capacity to acknowledge Him and to worship Him and to come to that conclusion. Also, we understand our, our, in our spiritual tradition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the progeny of Adam, basically human beings, am I not your Lord? And we replied, indeed, Allah is our Lord. So we know there is a self-evident truth that Allah not only exists, but He deserves to be worshipped. This is very profound, brothers and sisters. Therefore, the ayat, the verses, when they're talking about natural phenomena and created things, these verses are there to awaken the fitrah. This is so profound. And let me give you an example. Say when I was three years old, my favorite toy was a plastic Donald Duck. It's a famous cartoon in the West. And after 30 years or so, hypothetically, I go to my mother's basement and I'm clearing out her basement. And all of a sudden, I find Donald Duck. And I forgot all about my favorite toy. But all of a sudden, I found my old favorite toy. What happens to me? I'm like, oh my God, it's my favorite toy, Donald Duck. Oh yeah, I remember. This is the ultimate role of ayat. It's a dhikr. It's a reminder. The whole Quran is a reminder to remind us that our inner spiritual reality is that Allah deserves to be worshipped and we acknowledge this. Is to awaken the fitrah, is to awaken the innate disposition to conclude what is designed to conclude which Allah exists and He deserves to be worshipped. This is very important. So that's the role of ayat. These are the fundamental role of ayat. So when you discuss with ulama, with our scholars who are in touch with the classical tradition, you would see that these verses are designed to awaken that self-evident truth that Allah deserves to be worshipped. They're not there to make you realize there's only one way of doing science or one way of looking at the nitty gritties of how the embryo was developed or how the camel was created because our knowledge of that could change over time based on our expertise, based on progress, based on new equipment, based on new understanding, based on new theoretical models. So what Allah wants us to do is to really understand that regardless of our knowledge of science, two facts always remain. Number one, there must have been a wisdom behind this. Number two, there must have been a creative power. If that's the case, Allah deserves to be worshipped. Now there is a third objective as well, which is implied in the statements of our traditional scholars, where when Allah talks about created things, that you need to derive some kind of spiritual benefit, not a scientific benefit. For example, Allah mentions that we were a nutfa, we were a nutfa tin min maniyin, we were a drop of fluid from a despised fluid. Now that is that that verse is not there necessarily to make you think, oh wow. This means sperm, this means the egg, this is a miracle, this is science. No, it's there to make you realize, who are you? You are dependent, you're not independent, you're not self-sufficient. You came from a drop of fluid. Who created the causes in the universe in order for you to be formed from a drop of fluid? Allah. You're dependent on Allah alone. Also, don't think you're arrogant, that you could take over the world, that you think you're someone special, that you're better than others. Because remember, you came from a drop of fluid. This is who you are, so humble yourself. Do you see the profound spiritual lessons we learn from these verses, is ayat? They're not there to give you details per se, but they're there to give you spiritual insights. For example, in this case, that you must be humble, that you're dependent, and ultimately you're dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And fundamentally, as we know, that is to show us that there is a creative power behind these things and a wisdom behind these things. Therefore, Allah deserves to be worshipped. So this whole scientific miracles in the Quran narrative really ignores the fundamental reason for these verses, which is to give you a spiritual insight and to allow you to conclude that Allah deserves to be worshipped because there is a creative power behind this and there is wisdom behind this. These ayat are not there to make you think that the knowledge that you have of the science is the absolute truth. That is arrogance and it's not scientific at all because we may have a 
future observation or another observation that denies previous conclusions. So number two, let's keep on deconstructing this approach before we reconstruct something else. Number two, this is called the fallacy of the undistributed middle. The fallacy of the undistributed middle. Now the science and the Quran miracle claim commits a logical fallacy. What does the logical fallacy mean? It basically means you're not reasoning properly. You are not reasoning properly. And the fallacy of the undistributed middle is where two different things are made the same because of a common ground. Two different things are made the same because of a, because of a common ground. Let me give you an example. Number one, John needs oxygen to survive. Number two, my dog needs oxygen to survive. Number three, therefore John is my dog. Do you see the fallacy here? Now just because John needs oxygen and my dog needs oxygen, it doesn't mean John is my dog. Yes, they share a common ground which is oxygen, but it doesn't mean they're the same. This is what you call the fallacy of the undistributed middle. By the way, I don't have a dog. It's just a hypothetical example, okay? Now, let's apply this logical fallacy to the Quranic, the scientific Quranic miracles claim. Let's do it in a, in, in, a, in a general summary first. Number one, a description of a scientific fact A uses C. Number two, a description in the Quran B uses C. Number three, therefore, the description in the Quran B is the description of A. But that doesn't follow. It doesn't follow at all. Just because A uses C and B uses C, it doesn't mean A and B are the same. Now let me explain this much properly for you to understand, giving you some uh, applicable examples. So let's use the example of embryology. Okay, let's apply and understand this logical fallacy from the context of embryology. The embryology claim, the miracle claim in the Quran. Number one. The scientific fact in embryology is the implantation of the blastocyst in the uterine wall. Implantation can be attributed as a safe place. Number two, the Quran uses the words Qararin Makin, which can mean a safe place. Number three, therefore, the Quran is describing the scientific fact of the implantation of the blastocyst. This is a logical fallacy. Just because in embryology you can attribute implantation as a safe place and just because the words Qarad and Makin can mean a safe place it doesn't mean they're referring to the same thing this doesn't logically follow it would only follow if Qarad and Makin meaning a safe place can only refer to implantation but you could never prove that at all especially when we have our classical ulama who never understood it this way they understood this verse to mean the womb and not implantation, for example. Let me give you another example of this logical fallacy. The Earth's atmosphere. Number one. There is a scientific fact that the Earth's atmosphere helps destroy meteorites as they approach Earth, filters harmful light rays, protects against the cold temperatures of space, and its Van Allen Bell acts like a shield against harmful radiation. The Earth's atmosphere can be attributed as a protected roof. Number two. The Quran uses the words... Saqfan mahfuzan, which means a protected roof. Number three, therefore the Quran is describing the function of the earth's atmosphere. Now again, this is a logical fallacy. Because just because the earth's atmosphere can be attributed as a protected roof, and just because the word saqfan mahfuzan can mean a protected roof, it doesn't mean they're referring to the same thing. It doesn't mean the Quran is describing the function of the earth's atmosphere in that way. That's a logical fallacy, especially since we have other ulama who understood it differently. And this is very important for us to understand. It's a logical fallacy. Because a miracle claim can only be a miracle if you're saying this is the only thing it can mean. And you can't say that, especially in our classical tradition, which we're going to discuss later. So, we've dealt with the first two points. Let's go to the third point that deconstructs the so-called scientific miracles in the Qur'an claim. And this is a very profound point. It's very important because a lot of these scientific miracle claims rest upon this assumption, which is basically a misunderstanding of history. So this is the third point, inaccurate history. Now this is what people say. The people who articulate the scientific miracles in the Qur'an used to say or, or, or say the following. Number one, 
the knowledge implied by the Quranic verses was not available or discovered at the time of the 7th century. This, by the way, is false, which we're going to discuss. Number two, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, could have not had access to the knowledge implied by the Quranic verses. Again, this is absolutely not true. And we're, and we're going to break down these assumptions because the whole Quranic miracle, Quranic scientific miracle claim rests upon these two false assumptions. So let's go back to the first assumption so we could break it down slowly. Just to remind you, the assumption is the knowledge implied by the Quranic verses was not available or discovered at the time of Revelation, which was the 7th century. This, brothers and sisters, is absolutely false. Let me give you some examples. Let's take the example of sending down of iron. Many argue that there is a scientific miracle because Allah says in chapter 57, verse 25, and we sent down iron, and we sent down iron. We know now in science that there is some iron ore in meteorites, and we know meteorites came out of space onto earth. So in a way, it was sent down. People claim miracle. Again, this is not true because you have to base it on one of the historical assumptions, a false assumption that no one knew this information, which is not true. For instance, the ancient Egyptians, 1400 years before the prophethood of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they referred to iron as the following, ba en pet which means iron from heaven. So other civilizations had this knowledge, and I'm going to send some slides to you guys, I'll put it on my Facebook, that you can download, that give you all of these references, inshallah, God willing. Let me give you another example. The moon being a borrowed light. You know, the claim is that no one knew that the moon never had its own light. They didn't know that the moon reflected the light of the sun. And the Quran says in the following verse, in chapter 10, verse 5, it is he who made the sun a shining light and the moon a nuran, a derived light. And nuran can mean that it's a derived light. So it borrows its light. And they claimed no one knew this at the time. It must be a miracle. Again, this is a historical fallacy. This is inaccurate history. This is absolutely false. For example, 500 years BC, which is around 1200 years before Quranic revelation, the Greek Thales, he said the moon is lighted from the sun. Not only did they say that the moon doesn't have its own light, they even said where the light came from. But in the Quran, it doesn't say this. So why are we attributing to the Quran something that is based on, on, on shaky ground? Anaxagoras, another Greek, in around the same period, he said the moon does not have its own light, but light from the sun. Aristarchus of Samos, around the same period, 300 BC, he also said that the moon was lighted by the sun. And we need to be consistent because Allah refers to his light as nur. The word nur, right? Are you saying Allah's light is a borrowed light? Now you may say, Hamza, that's so silly because we know in Quranic linguistics and tafsir and exegesis, you have to understand the context of the sentence and how the word is placed and what the ulama said. I agree. But why therefore do you ignore the ulama and the context of the verse when it comes to the moon? We have to be consistent in our approach. Another example. The mountains have roots. Allah says in the Quran in chapter 78, verse 6 to 7, verses 6 to 7, have we not made the earth a wide expanse and the mountains as pegs? Now, forget the word pegs. Some people just do linguistic gymnastics and say, oh, this means roots. Because we know now in geology that mountains have roots. There is a theory that mountains have root-like structures. There's an academic book. I have it over there, actually. I don't think I could bring it, but it's on top of that... Uh, library thing it basically says it has a subtitle saying do mountains have roots and they justify that mountains have roots which is fair enough but the Quran is not using the word roots it's using the word peg and that's what's very interesting but even if you were to take the meaning of the word roots this was known before the Quranic revelation it was in the Bible itself in the ancient Hebrews for example in Bible Jonah 2 6 it says the following the roots of the mountains I sank down the earth beneath barred me forever, but you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. Now the key word in this verse in Hebrew, it means extremity. And it's a poetic description of the bottom or the roots of mountains. So this was similar, similar knowledge in the Bible. So you can't really claim miracle because the ancient Hebrews had this information too.
What about the Big Bang? We use the famous verse in chapter 21, verse 30. Have not those who disbelieve known that the heavens and the earth were one piece and we parted them? Now, for me, this is a bit silly because we relate this to the Big Bang. Whoever does this knows nothing about the Big Bang with humble, with, with my humble attitude, okay, or respect. No one know, no, you can't correlate this to the Big Bang. If we study the Big Bang, forget popular science and what you read on YouTube or what you see on YouTube and in, and in the newspapers. The Big Bang is quite complex. There are different competing models. Actually, there are competing models and they all have the similar evidence. And there is ikhtilaf, as we say in Arabic. There is a difference of opinion on what model is the strongest. For example, you have the quantum fluctuation model. You have the freedom and lemma itraya model. You have the oscillating model. There's around, what, maybe 20 competing models. And we treat this as the gospel truth, where, as revelation. There's only one way of looking at the Big Bang, and it's this way. It was a condensed piece of matter, and it, was, and, and it blew apart, and we had this Big Bang. That's actually shallow science. There are a lot of scientists now that they believe in, in a pre-eternity, that there was no limited time. That the universe was eternal. It came from this eternal kind of quantum haze or something. Who knows what the science is? I'm not claiming to be a science. But if you go to the journals, you go to the books, it's not one way. So why are we saying this is a miracle and this correlates to the Big Bang? What model of the Big Bang? There are many competing models and some of them contradict this verse. Now, I'm not, obviously we're not saying the verse is wrong. But what, say, what we're saying is, what's wrong is that we're using this verse... And try to correlate it to science, assuming the science is static and the science will not change. And we're assuming that this refers to the Big Bang, which we can't even make such a claim. And what's interesting, even in Sumerian literature, which is what, maybe 6,000 years old or maybe four, or 5,000 years old, we find similar concepts in the Epic of Gilgamesh. For example, it says, when the heavens had been separated from the earth. Same type of concept. We're not saying it's borrowed, we're not saying Qur'an is wrong, but what we're saying is do not create a narrative for the Qur'an that's based on false assumptions. And one of those false assumptions is what? It simply is that no one could have known this information. That's not true, and we've given you many examples from the Big Bang to the moon, to the mountains having roots, etc, etc. So let's go to the second false historical assumption. For the scientific miracles Qur'an claimed to work, not only must it be based on the fact that no one knew this information at the time, but it, even if you were to concede, for instance, that people knew at the time or there were civilizations that had this knowledge, you have to, you have to assume that the Prophet wasallam could not have had access to the knowledge implied by the Quranic verses. That's the other assumption here, which is false as well. That the Prophet wasallam could not have had access to the knowledge implied by the Quranic verses. This is absolutely false. Because to claim such a thing, we have to deny history, we have to deny prophetic history, and we have to deny hadith, prophetic traditions. For example, brothers and sisters, there is an authentic hadith that can be found in the tradition Sahih Muslim, in, in Muslim. And this is where the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, he looked into another civilization, the Persians and the Romans. He looked into the Persians and the Romans to find out if it was okay for his companions to cohabit with the suckling wives. And this is the English translation of the hadith. I intended to prohibit cohabitation with the suckling women, but I considered the Romans and the Persians and saw that they suckle the children and this thing does no harm to them. Now this tradition is beautiful. It teaches us when it comes to medicine and science and civilizational knowledge that we have to share knowledge with other people, whoever they are, Muslim and non-Muslim. Like we're, we're a human family concerning knowledge and the progress of humanity. This is beautiful. And it shows to us that the Prophet Muhammad upon him peace had access to knowledge from other civilizations. So the assumption that the Prophet Muhammad upon him peace couldn't have had access to other civilizations is absolutely false. False. And it denies this prophetic tradition. Not only this, it denies established history. We know that the established history of the 6th century, of the 7th century, that Mecca was a trading city. Even the Arabs would go as far as Africa and China to trade. You think they had no exchange of culture? You think they vowed 
a few years of silence and went to another nation, took their goods, kept that vow of silence and came back? No, these were human beings who interacted and exchanged culture. And that's why the historian Era M. Lapidus, in his famous book, A History of Islamic Societies, he clearly states this reality. He says, by the mid-6th century, as heir to Petra and Palmyra, Mecca became one of the most important caravan cities of the Middle East. The Meccans carried spices, leather, drugs, cloth and slaves, which had come from Africa or the Far East to Syria and returned money, weapons, cereals and wine to Arabia. So there was an exchange of culture, obviously, because they went all the way to Syria and the Far East and Africa. Now, I want you to note something very carefully, brothers and sisters. Be very careful here. We are not saying the Quran borrowed knowledge or is inaccurate. We're not saying this. It is a miracle for many other reasons. A linguistic miracle, a, a literary structural miracle, a historical miracle, a spiritual miracle. We have an array of arguments for the Quran, so don't worry. And we will address these, address these arguments live on Facebook as well, if God permits, inshallah. So we're not saying the Quran is not a miracle. We have so many good arguments for the Quran. And we're not saying the Quran is not inaccurate. All we're saying is this. That the narrative for the scientific miracle Quran claim is a false narrative because it's based on false assumptions, it commits a logical fallacy, it has to deny history, it has to mis misinterpret the main purpose of the verses of the Quran, it despiritualizes the Quran, it actually makes science into a divine yardstick, which is not the case. It deifies science. That's not the whole point of science. The, po the beauty of science is that it can always change. Even with things that we believe to be true, in fact, can change. And that's the beauty of science. So this shows to us that we need a, a new approach. Well, it's new to us, but it's really an old approach. We need to revive the orthodox approach in understanding the Quran and natural phenomena. So be very careful. And that's why it's very important that no way, no way are we saying that the Quran borrowed from these civilizations. Because if the Quran borrowed from these civilizations then it means the language must only reflect the 7th century or the language must only reflect that time. But when we discuss the new approach in a few minutes, you would see that the Quranic language describing natural phenomena doesn't reflect the 7th century. It's almost timeless. It is timeless. And that shows that there could be no borrowing. Another thing that some maybe our beloved brothers in Christianity, they may argue, oh, the Quran just borrowed from... The biblical text, again, this is false because if you study history, you study narratives in the Quran, the Quran actually corrects the Bible on a few issues, especially the reference of the leader of the Egyptians at the time of Moses and the time of Joseph. So how can you claim the Quran borrowed from the Bible when the Quran actually corrects the Bible? That would be opening kind of worms for yourselves. So there's no borrowing. We're not saying the Quran is inaccurate. All we're saying is the Quranic scientific miracles claim is a logical fallacy, it's based on false assumptions, it deifies science, it misunderstands science, it misunderstands the verses in the Qur'an. So, let's now go to the fourth point, which again is about the philosophy of science. I actually mentioned this in the beginning, so I'm going to summarize it now. We already discussed that science doesn't lead to certainty. We already discussed that things like induction, the hypothetical deductive model, holism, all these other aspects in the philosophy of science show that science doesn't lead to certainty. It's great and it's beautiful and we love it. And we know that there can be another observation that we haven't observed that can contradict previous conclusions. So there's always that possibility. Hence, scientific knowledge is probabilistic. Yes, it ranges in, in different levels of probability, 50%, 80%, 99%, but never 100%, especially when it comes to more complex theoretical constructs. And what's very interesting is that therefore science is very time bound because it does change. If you read Kuhn, for example, uh, Thomas Kuhn, who was the American physicist, but he looked at the history of science and he looked at different paradigm shifts. And when he looked into science, he said, look, you know, science always changes. There's always these paradigm shifts because every theory has an anom anomaly. It may come up and you can't address these anomalies and therefore it creates a crisis and therefore you have a new paradigm that explains these anomalies or sees them in a different way. So the, the point here is science doesn't need to certainty. So how can we use something that is not certain to prove that's, that something that is certain, which is the Quran itself? So how can you use a time-bound truth to prove a timeless truth? This is a methodological fallacy.
And maybe this is why Jalees Rahman, who is a cardiology fellow at Indiana University School of Medicine, he wrote a, an essay calling, calling Searching for Scientific Facts in the Quran, Islamization of Knowledge or a New Form of Scientism. And you can find this in Islam and Science published in 2003. He said the following. One danger of such attempts to correlate modern science with the Quran is that it makes a linkage between the perennial wisdom, which means the timeless wisdom and truth of the Quran, with the transient ideas of modern science, which means the time-bound ideas of modern science. And we've already discussed the problems of induction, that science doesn't lead to certainty, it's dynamic, it change, changes over time. There's always a possibility of a new observation changing or going against previous conclusions. Also, just because it works, it doesn't mean it's true. And we gave the example in the beginning of phlogiston. If you went here, let me just give you that example. Because many people think, well, science must be right because it's working. That's not true. Because just because it works, it doesn't mean it's true. If you look at the theory of phlogiston in the 18th century, phlogiston was a theory that in objects that would burn, they were combustible. They basically had something called phlogiston. And when they burned, they released phlogisticated air. And this was a workable theory. It was so workable that in 1773, Dan Rutherford used this workable theory and he discovered a truth called nitrogen. And then, But after that, they found out that the theory of phlogiston was absolutely false. So what does this teach us? It teaches us that you could get a truth from a false theory. You could use a false theory that is currently working to give you a truth. And, and you could have something that's working that's absolutely false. And that's the beauty of science people. So don't say, oh, but it works. But it doesn't mean it's true. So how can you use such a methodology to prove something that doesn't change or something that's supposed to be absolute and true? The fifth point to deconstruct the scientific miracles in the Quran approach is what you call unscientific verses. Whether we like it or not, there are some verses that you cannot directly understand using science. Let's just be honest. Especially the function of the mountains or even concepts like evolution. Currently, from our limited human knowledge, some people argue that Darwinism is the best theory to explain evolution. Evolution is essentially genetic variation. It's changed. There are like six definitions for evolution, but let's just stick to this one. And Darwinism is the theory or the mechanism that explains the observation. Now, an orthodox understanding of some of the verses in the Quran would directly contradict Darwinism. But according to the scientific paradigm, Darwinism is currently the best explanation. It doesn't mean it's the truest. As Professor David Stove said, Darwinism is the best that we have, but it's not the truest. It's not the truth in terms of absolutes. And that's the beauty of science. Now, the point here is, if we're consistent with this Quranic, miracles, Quranic scientific miracles claim, then other science should be in line with the Quran, like Darwinism. But they're like, oh, it's just a theory. But you can't say that. That's very false science. Because theory in science has quite a high value. Because the Big Bang is also a theory. And other things that we use to prove the Qur'an are still very theoretical. Even the expansion of the universe. And this is very important for us to understand. We can't have our cake and eat it. Now what's interesting is this. Why do we use the Big Bang to prove the Qur'an? Because that's just a theory. And Darwinism, according to you, is just a theory. But they have almost the same weight. They, they have been verified to the relatively same degree. Some people would argue that even Darwinism has been far more verified than, than the Big Bang, right? So why do we take one and not the other? It shows a huge inconsistency in this approach and it opens a gaping intellectual hole. We can't have our cake and eat it, people. And that's what we have to understand. Finally, the sixth point to deconstruct this approach. We need to understand, brothers and sisters, the general principles of usul tafsir the science of interpreting the Qur'an. I'm not claiming to be a scholar, but this is my humble understanding with sitting with some ulama, with some scholars. When you have a verse or a word, when you have a verse or a word concerning natural phenomena, brothers and sisters, when you have a verse or a word concerning natural phenomena, you don't have a prophetic tradition to explain it. You don't have ijma'as of, of sahaba. You don't have the consensus of the companions. You don't have all the other things that are necessary to interpret the Qur'an. Then you're left with the language. You have to go to the classical poetry. You have to go to the, Arab, the understanding of the nuances of the Arabic language. If that's the case, you cannot claim absolute certainties. Because one word may have many e meanings. 
Now, if you only choose one meaning and say this is absolutely the only meaning, then this is this is wrong. You can't say such a thing. You can only say it may mean this. It may mean this and it may mean that. You can't say no, this meaning that I've chosen is the only meaning and I don't care what anyone else says. You can't say that in absence of prophetic tradition, in absence of the other things that allow us to, or, or the other tools and, and, and principles and sources that allow us to understand the Quran. You have to rely on the language. When you rely on the language, you may have many meanings. You can't arrogate to yourself, this was the only intended meaning. And for the Quranic scientific miracle in the Quran claim to be true, you have to say this is the only intended meaning. Otherwise, it's not a miracle because there may be a possible meaning that could be different. So these were the six ways of deconstructing that approach. Now let's talk about the new approach in around the last 15 minutes that we have. And brothers and sisters, you're going to love this approach, okay? Now this new this approach is not really new. It's based on our orthodox spiritual tradition. And that's the powerful thing about this. It's, it's based on the deep, profound, spiritual understanding of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's a understanding of reality because it puts science in its place. It's a limited method. It's great. It works. It gives us so many beautiful things, but it doesn't lead to certainty. And it can change. There could be a future observation that denies previous conclusions. And what it does as well, it, it revives the original purpose of verses concerning natural phenomena. For us to understand that there's a creative power in the universe, that there's wisdom behind the universe, and that these things should give us spiritual insights. And essentially, or to conclude that Allah deserves to be worshipped. This is the profound point. Not for us to think that there are some kind of scientific mechanism and details here. No, that's not the point. Allah wants to talk to all people. He doesn't want to talk to only you in the 21st century. Why are we being so arrogant? He wants to talk to the 7th century man, to the 10th century man, to the 15th century man and woman, to the 21st century man and woman, to the 31st century man and woman. Allah wants to speak to everybody. So don't think that Allah is only waiting for you to have correct scientific knowledge for these verses to address you. No, don't belittle the Quran like this. The Quran is spiritually timeless. The Quran is timeless. And that's why when he uses a word, it addresses all mindsets. And he has many layers of meaning that can address all mindsets across different periods of civilization. That's so profound. Because Allah wants to talk to you and me in the 7th century or in the 21st century. So the understanding and the impact of these verses are not contingent. They're not dependent on our scientific knowledge. They're dependent on the basic rational knowledge of the fact that regardless of my scientific understanding, I'm always going to conclude and know that there must have been a creative power behind this and there's wisdom in the universe. So what's the summary of the orthodox approach? Now remember, the Quranic verses pertaining to natural phenomena, they aim to do the following. Number one, make us reflect on God's creative power, Allah's creative power, His wisdom and knowledge, to conclude that He exists and deserves to be worshipped. Number two, to evoke, to bring about the understanding that Allah has the totality of wisdom and knowledge and we have fragmentary pieces. So he deserves to be worshipped. Allah has the picture. We just have the pixel. Allah has the picture. We got the pixel. So why are we claiming our pixel is the picture? That's not true. We don't have the totality of knowledge and wisdom. Allah has the totality of knowledge and wisdom. So this new approach or this orthodox approach rather, is quite powerful and I call it the multi-layered and multi-leveled approach. Number one, it's multi-layered, meaning that the verses or words used to describe natural phenomena have many layers of meaning. And number two, it's multi-leveled, that these meanings address different levels of understanding throughout time. Now these meanings, they may have a scientific understanding, they may have no scientific understanding, they may have no understanding from an empirical perspective. They may just have an understanding from a spiritual and existential perspective. Now, let me give you some examples. And these examples, brothers and sisters, I think you'll find very profound. And as I'm giving these examples, you'll understand the powerful, timeless, profound nature of the Book of Allah. And what's interesting with this approach, it deals with all the contentions you find on the internet and in academic literature. It deals with these contentions about the fact that the, the Prophet some so-called borrowed from Greek medicine, about the fact that the Qur'an is based on primitive knowledge. This approach deals with all of that. It deals with these contentions very easily. So, let's start giving these examples so we understand this orthodox approach. Let's start with the orbits. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in 
chapter 21, verse 33. He says, And it is he who created the night and the day, and the sun and the moon, all in an orbit are swimming. The Arabic word here is, Yasbahuna, swimming. Now, what th this is very interesting. This word has many layers of meaning and can apply to different understandings over time. So it's multi-layered and multi-leveled. For example, at the time of Revelation, the 7th century, the word yasbahuna, which means swimming or floating, could be used to describe the sun and moon in motion. Now, a, a, an Arab with the, with the naked eye, a desert Arab with the naked eye, he could look into the ocean of space and conclude the sun and moon, moon are swimming in the ocean of space. So that's a 7th century understanding. But for him to realize, wow, who did that? There's a wisdom behind this. There's a creative power behind this. Therefore, Allah deserves to be worshipped. Now, the word also makes sense to us in a 21st century sense because it can relate to today's scientific findings of celestial mechanics. Now, what's interesting is Professor of Islamic Studies at Youngstown State University, Munsta Mir, he also says the same thing. He says the word yasbahuna in the verse which we just mentioned, made good sense to 7th century Arabs observing natural phenomena of the naked eye. It is equally meaningful, meaningful to us in light of today's scientific findings. Now, what's even interesting here is, as well is, is that when Allah says the sun is swimming, this could refer to a primitive understanding that some Arabs had, that the sun was going around the earth. This is, we know, is false. But there was an understanding of the time. They could maybe take that understanding, but still conclude that there's a power behind this and there is a wisdom behind this, therefore Allah deserves to be worshipped. What's very profound is that it's also very accurate as well. Because in the 21st century, we know the sun does have its orbit. It does move in that way. And according to physicists or cosmologists, the sun orbits the Milky Way and it takes 226 million years for it to do so. So as you can see here, the Qur'an's words are multi-layered in meaning, multi-leveled, they address different mindsets over time. Let me give you another example, the expansion of the universe, the expanding universe. Allah says in the Qur'an in chapter 51 verse 47, And the heaven we constructed with strength, and indeed we are its expander. Now the word Arabic word here, expander, can mean quite a few things according to the various tafsir, according to the various exegetical works. Number one, it could mean that the universe is big, it's vast, and there's risk, there's provisions in the universe. It could also mean it was expanded. It could also mean it is continually expanding. Now what's interesting here is that from a classical 7th century perspective, this word obviously meant the naked eye situation stuff, which is the universe is big, and there's provisions in the universe, in the cosmos, for human beings. But however, what's very interesting is that the word can also mean that God is continually expanding the universe, which can relate to a modern understanding. Does it mean that? We don't know. Because it may change. There were some opinions, I think last year, some cosmologists argued that the universe is not expanding anymore. And this is the beauty of science. It changes based on different understandings, different observations, different ways to understand those observations. But what I'm trying to show here is, it can have a 7th century understanding, in a 21st century understanding, it's multi-layered, multi-leveled. Now, let me end by giving you a profound case study. I want to give you a case study with the word alaqa. Now, the word alaqa can be found in Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, ver around verse 14. Now, the word alaqa in a classical Arabic sense has five major meanings. Five, okay? Listen to them. And you can go to the text of Lisan al-Arab, you could go to Lane's Lexicon and others. These are the five major meanings. Number one, alaka means blood in a general sense. Number two, alaka means a blood clot. Number three, alaka means clay that sticks to the hand. Number four, alaka means something that clings. Number five, it means a leech or a worm. So let's take these many layers of meaning and apply them to different understandings over time. So let's apply one of the meanings to the 7th century understanding. So let's take the word blood clot. Alaka means blood clot. That's one of the valid re meanings. Many of the ulama, actually, ma majority of them, considered alaka to mean a blood clot. Now, the meaning of this word is not wrong. Because when you look at, for example, natural abortions, which are called miscarriages, you see that it's, it's a fleshy substance is filled with blood. So it looks like a blood clot. It's not inaccurate with the naked eye from that perspective. But you can't claim miracle because you can see it with the naked eye. 
What's interesting though, it's in line with a Greek understanding of medicine. And Greek understanding was quite popular at that time. You had the second century physician Galen, he wrote a book called Decemini, which means on semen. And it was published in Alexandria in the 5th century. It was even influenced schools in Iraq. It was predominant in the 6th century as well. There was a kind of Hellenic medical understanding of the time. And what's interesting, and I've read this myself in the Greek, I could read and write Greek. Uh, thanks to my mom, who would always say to me, Andrea, she said, Andreas, you know, you're going to remind, remember me one day, you have to go Greek school. And she's right, I've actually used it for this research. So may, 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 may Allah bless my parents and my mother and everybody else. So, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so I went to the Greek text itself, it's, it's classical Greek. And Galen, he uses the Greek words, sarkoidis, and he uses the word, emados. Sarkoidis means fleshy, Emados means bloody. It's a bloody, fleshy thing. So it's like a blood clot. So you see the Quran here, one of the meanings of Allah is addressing the mentality of the time. The mentality of the time. In order for us to realize, not that there's some kind of scientific detail here, but oh my God, subhanAllah, glory be to Allah. I came from a bloody mess. And some of us are still in a bloody mess, unfortunately. Yeah, I came from this bloody mess. I came from a fleshy blood clot. That's what I came from. Essentially, if you look at it with the naked eye, that's what it looks like. So you should look at the spiritual dimension here and the profound intellectual dimension, regardless of scientific details. What, who put these physical causes in place for me to emerge and be formed and be shaped from this blood clot? What kind of wisdom and power must have been in this universe? Allah, He deserves to be worshipped. Also, it should give you this humility. I came from a bloody mess. I came from this blood... This, this fleshy, bloody substance. And now I think I'm arrogant and I'm better than everybody else. Very profound, brothers and sisters. Also, brothers and sisters, is also appropriate for our time. The word alaka could mean leech or a worm. And if you look and, and, and if you look into history, by the 15th century, we discovered the microscope. If you use the microscope, uh, it was developed a little bit more after a few more years. And if you use the microscope in the 15th century and after you would see that around day 25, that what happens? You look at the embryo, and it looks like a leech or worm. You can't see this with the naked eye, so you may have a modern understanding. And we know it looks like a leech or worm because you can see photos. And not only that, we have academics who say this. Dr. Dale Lehman, in his book, Anatomy Demystified, he described the embryo as a worm. Even P.Z. Myers, Professor P.Z. Myers, who's, who's an atheist, who's not very friendly towards Islam, he also mentions in his blog, and I have the screenshot, that the embryo looks like a worm. The point here is, though, that it looks like a worm or a leech. So he may have a modern understanding. Who knows? But what's interesting for me here is, is yes, there are many layers of meaning, and, and, and it's appropriate for many, for different understandings. But for me, I connect more with the spiritual existential understanding. What does it mean for me as a spiritual human being? What does it mean for me as a human being trying to understand Allah's world, and Allah's word, God's world and God's word. And I and I would argue there's a timeless non-scientific perspective here because why do we think that we have to reduce the book of Allah to reductionism, to, to empirical sciences? Science changes. Have a more deeper understanding, a more spiritual, rational understanding that there are some timeless truths here, that there are some timeless, there's a timeless wisdom here. And just to remind you, there must have been a created power behind this. There must have been a wisdom behind this. Therefore, Allah deserves to be worshipped. But there's also timeless spiritual lessons as well. Think about the concept of the, of the leech. Maybe Allah is saying that we were literally like leeches. A leech is a parasite. It drains the resources of its host. Maybe Allah is saying we as babies, as embryos in our mother's wombs, were like leeches draining the resources of our mother. She willingly and willfully gave up her resources for us to be alive today. Therefore, we must lower the wing of humility. We must love and respect and honor our parents and fundamentally honor and love our mothers because they gave us something that's which we could never give them. That's profound, brothers and sisters. That is absolutely profound. And you know what's very interesting? Professor of Science, Lord Robert Wilson, he is a professor an emeritus professor of fertility studies at Imperial College University. Do you know what he said? He said this in a documentary. Listen very carefully. 
The leech takes whatever it needs to live by sucking the blood of whatever it can latch onto. In this case, that's me. He had a leech on his hand at that time. As it sucks my blood, it takes from it all that it needs to live. It literally lives off me and the whole of pregnancy is shaped by a similar kind of parasitic relationship. Unlike the leech, the developing embryo doesn't suck the maternal blood, but it does raid her blood for the raw materials it needs to grow. From the word go, both leech and embryo are out for themselves. Isn't that profound? What does that instill inside you spiritually and morally and ethically? That we must love our mothers, man. She gave us something that we can never give her. Her resources. Nine months. The pain of labor. And I'm telling you, once you, once you experience labor, not obviously I've experienced labor, but when you get married and you see your children come, the sacrifices our wives make and our mothers make are sacrifices that men could never do. Honestly, absolutely never. That's why the status of the woman in the psalm is so high and she's so honored and respected because the minute you just contemplate on childbirth and even the process of Pregnancy, I'm telling you, hats off. Allahu Akbar. God is greater. You know, the reward is high and we know that there's a profound profound spiritual dimension to these things. I mean, we, we have to honor our women and we know this, respect them and take care of them because they, they've done something for us that we could never do, ever. So let's be humble, guys. Anyway, so we see that the Quran is multi-layered, many layers of meaning and approaches different mindsets over time, different levels of understanding. It may have a scientific meaning. It may have no scientific meaning. It might be scientifically inaccurate. Who cares? We've already discussed. Science changes. How do you know the science we have today is the absolute truth? We have no idea. It might not be the absolute truth. And just even because it works, as we mentioned, it doesn't mean it's true. But another thing I want to mention, maybe when the Quran mentions about natural phenomena and we can't find any science, maybe it's to encourage more science. Remember, Ibn al-Haytham, you may know of him. He was called the first scientist by history, historians of science, like David C. Limburg. He said that Ibn al-Haytham was the first formal science. He wrote the book on optics at a systematic scientific method there. And Ibn al-Haytham, in his biographical accounts, he said that the reason he did the science, he wanted to understand the will of God, the will of Allah. So the Quran encouraged him. Even if there was no science justifying some of these verses, the verses themselves just encouraged him to know more, to try and understand what is the wisdom of Allah. I have the pixel, Allah has the picture. And so it created that drive for him to know more. So he may not even have any scientific understanding. It's not a problem. So here's a conclusion, brothers and sisters. Number one, the scientific miracles approach is based on false assumptions and misrepresents the Qur'an. Number two, the Qur'an uses words to point to natural phenomena. Number three, these words may have many layers of meaning and address many levels of understanding. Number four, they may not have a scientific meaning. Number five, the main point is, regardless of what we know about the science, is to conclude that Allah deserves to be worshipped. Because there must have been a creative power and wisdom behind the phenomena in question. And also, when we reflect on these verses, it should give us a spiritual understanding that we're dependent. Therefore, we must be... So, we're, we're dependent. Therefore, we must be dependent upon Allah who is independent. And that we must understand that we're limited and human and we're weak. Therefore, we must be humble. And therefore, we understand that Allah deserves to be worshipped in every circumstance. So from this perspective, brothers and sisters, even if there's a scientific contradiction with the Quran, the easiest thing to understand is, so what? Because science changes, doesn't mean it's absolute truth. There may be a future observation that contradicts previous conclusions. And just because it works, as we discussed, it doesn't mean it's true. So if there's any so-called scientific contradiction, big deal. And also, we can't use scientific miracles in the Qur'an, because science changes, the Qur'an doesn't change, the science might not be right. And I'll give you a challenge. For us to conclude that there are scientific miracles in the Qur'an, you have to claim two things. That the word, that the meaning you've attributed to a certain word is the only intended meaning, and the science that you've chosen is never ever going to change. And I'm telling you, you can never claim such a thing. Because science can change, as we know, there's no absolutes, especially when it comes to faith theoretical things like the Big Bang and things like Darwinism and so many different things.
And also, you can't claim that this meaning you have of this word is the only intended meaning because when we don't have any prophetic tradition to explain it or the other sources to explain it and we just rely on the language, we can just say it has a scope of meaning. But for it to be a miracle, it must have only one meaning because if there's other meanings, then who decides to pick which meaning? Why are you superimposing a scientific narrative on the Qur'an? And we shouldn't deify science, make it the gospel truth, if you like, because the Qur'an is timeless, science is time-bound, and it changes, and that's the beauty of science. And that's why Muslims are encouraged to continue to do science. We shouldn't be afraid of it, we should love it and embrace it, even if some of its conclusions contradict the Qur'an, because it's not a problem. It's a working model, some conclusions are working in progress, they're based on limited data, we may have a future observation that denies previous conclusions, and we know the Qur'an to be true spiritually and it's very profound. So when Allah talks about verses that relate to natural phenomena, essentially they're there to make us realize that we don't deserve worship. Creation doesn't deserve worship. Allah deserves to be worshipped. There was a wisdom behind these creative things. There's a creative power behind these things. And that's why Allah deserves to be worshipped. That's the point that we have to understand. And this allows us to reconnect with the book of Allah. So when we look at these verses, we look at, you know, where does it indicate that there is a wisdom and there is a creative power? Wow, when I look into the camel, regardless of my scientific knowledge, I know there must have been a wisdom and a creative power behind this. When I look into the embryological process, regardless of my scientific knowledge, I may be right, I may be wrong, but it just goes to show to me, regardless of my knowledge of the science, there must have been a power, there must have been a wisdom, therefore Allah deserves to be worshipped. And also from a spiritual perspective, it makes me understand Spiritual realities that I came from a piece, a, a mingled fluid. I should be humble, not arrogant. I shouldn't act like I'm self sufficient because that mingled fluid was dependent on so many different variables and ultimately dependent on Allah. So we should be humble. And we know humility is a path to guidance and it breaks the nafs and the ego. So, brothers and sisters, I hope you've understood this. It's a far more intelligent approach is based on a classical orthodox tradition that the Quran is multi-layered, multi-leveled, addresses different realities. It may be a scientific one, it may not be, it may contradict science, so what, as we discussed, and it just may just con want to connect with us from a spiritual perspective. So let's not superimpose a reductionist paradigm on the Book of Allah. The Book of Allah transcends this, it's, it's timeless wisdom. And so let's not make it contingent to this time-bound, limited human knowledge. And um, I hope you've understood this. And what I'll try and do is clarify more concerning this. Obviously, one hour may not be enough. I'll send you my slides. <coughs> Rewatch this video on my Facebook page. And if you found it very useful, then send it to people who actually use the scientific miracles in the Quran claim. Send it to them for them to learn, for us to exchange ideas, and for us to understand that, that the Quran is transcends science, is powerful, it's profound. Now this, by the way, doesn't mean you can't do tadabbur, ponder upon the Qur'an and try and correlate to some scientific things. There's no problem with that per se. But don't claim miracle. Don't claim this is the only intended meaning and don't claim that this science is never going to change. Because that goes against the history of science, it goes against the philosophy of science, it goes against academia, and it goes against the principles of tafsir, the principles of understanding the Qur'an. Engage with the Qur'an how it was intended to be engaged with, which is that we realize that behind all aspects of creation, regardless of our scientific knowledge, there must always be a wisdom behind it, always a creative power behind it, and therefore Allah deserves worship. And even when we look at these natural phenomena, it gives us a spiritual insight that we must be humble and we must realize that we're ultimately dependent on Allah. That's the point. That's profound beauty of the Qur'an. So don't reduce it to these empirical time-bound realities because Allah and His book transcends this. So I hope you enjoyed this and don't forget it, it deals with all the other contentions that you find online and offline and maybe we could discuss this another time. But anyway, we've gone for too long, one hour, nine minutes. May Allah bless you, guide you, may Allah love you, may Allah shower His mercy, His grace, may Allah shower His, his Rahmah, may Allah shower His guidance on every single person whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim, may Allah guide you all and ultimately shower you with His love and mercy because that's what Islam is about, is to give everybody the opportunity to basically have access to the mercy of God.
and his profound love as Allah is al-wudud which means the loving coming from the Arabic word wud which means a loving that is giving and therefore we don't want to be in the position where we harm our own souls because we don't want to run away from his mercy we want to embrace his mercy and that's the message that we want to give to everybody brothers and sisters take care of yourselves Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh love you all